gentlemen. This is Terry Martin with the Illinois Channel. And uh, one of the things that we are wanting to do is to not just be covering events at the state capitol or focusing on some of the things in Chicago, as we have been focusing on, but also to cover all parts of the Illinois. We are, after all, the Illinois Channel and not the Springfield Channel. And so with that, we want to introduce a segment which we call Voices of Illinois. And joining us on this first episode is former State Representative John Anthony. John, so good to see you, and thank you for joining us. Hey, Terry. So good to see you, too, and thanks so much for uh, reaching out and having me on. It's, it's, an, it's, it's really an honor. You were a member of the House of Representatives from what years, as a reminder to the audience? I was down there from uh, 2013 to 2016. And yeah. what, what, what is it that you're doing these days? Well, right now I, I do a lot of consultant work. Uh, my wife and I, we, 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 before I went into the General Assembly, uh, my wife and I, we were business consultants. Um, so I'm doing a lot of business consulting work. Um, I play in a few uh, campaigns, do a lot of the printing, the graphic design, uh, building websites, um, app, apps. Uh, so do, we're doing that a lot uh, throughout, actually throughout the entire United States of America. We have clients in in many parts of the United States of America that we're, we're working on, working with, I should say, right now, my wife and I. Also, in uh, before your, your time in the state legislature, part of your past, well, you were also a police officer. Yeah, so I was a, a, a city cop in, from the city of Champaign, and I was a deputy um, sheriff uh, from Kendall County. Oh. which is still the county that I reside in Does your, at this time. And right now you're in Joliet, is that right? Yeah, I live in Joliet. It's really Manuka, but it's it's the Joliet side of, of the Manuka area. My kids attend Manuka schools. Uh, I'm, I'm in the most southernmost part of Joliet, uh, literally probably a mile and a half maybe from uh, I-80, two, two miles, two and a half miles from I-80. I'm that close to um, uh, Manuka. And some of your consulting work, what, what kind of things are you consulting on? Does it involve law enforcement? Does it involve your time as a lawmaker or just or just what kind of things do you do? Well, a, a lot of what we do is, is actually small businesses. We've, we've really been helping a lot of small business. What we do is we help if a, if a small if somebody has an idea for a business, we actually help them start the business. Uh, we help them build the infrastructure for the business. Uh, we do the business plan for them. Uh, we build the website, if, if even uh, to the down to the nuts and bolts. Of, building starting off with a logo for someone uh, we, we've been doing that uh, as I said since 2008 uh, and way back when when I even before I got in the General Assembly and even before I was a law enforcement officer I started a not-for-profit called the Yarn Foundation which we um, housed in uh, uh, unincorporated Boulder Hill uh, up suburb just uh, just right outside of Montgomery Illinois so uh, we've been doing all that all this type of consulting work for businesses uh, probably since 2007. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, as a reminder of the people, you were a member of, of the Republican caucus. Uh, yes. So some of, the, I think then you, you were in there for a short time when Bruce Rauner came in and uh, now Rauner is gone. And a lot of people are writing about what is the future of the Republican party in Illinois. So, uh, you know, that's one thing I, I thought you having the wealth of experience that you have had mm -hmm. in and out of uh, state government. What do you see as the future at, at this point of the Republican Party? And obviously right now they're pretty much in the woods with the Democrats controlling the governorship in both houses of the legislature right now, as well as all the statewide offices. I mean, a super, super majority as well uh, uh, throughout Illinois politics. Uh, I, but, but I don't know if you've been watching, but we, we have a lot of young talent that has sprung up throughout the state of Illinois. I'll give you one example. Just right here in uh, Will County, uh, Will County was a part of my district. Uh, Will County just uh, selected the first black chairman, uh, George, George Pearson. He's the first black Republican person to ever chair a seat in the, in, in the state of Illinois. I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing. And, and it shows you just how progressive what Will County has been. Um, they've had a woman um, as a chairman, and now um, George Pearson as the um, chairman for the Will County Republican Central Committee. And when you look at, you look at, uh, I forget the guy's last name, but Deontay, he's down from the Decatur, Danville area. He's now in Washington, D.C. You have Cor Cornell Darden from Will County. He's the Will County Young Republican. I mean, so you, you, you look at, and I, I personally, I think the 
the Republican Party. Um, I'm always an optimist. Never, I've never been a guy who's, you know, looked at it and said, you know, we're out of hope. No, Illinois is worth fighting for. And I think when you look across the state, when you look across just everywhere throughout the, um, the state of Illinois, you see young, vibrant people fighting to reclaim Illinois as, as where it should be, one of the greatest states in the, uh, the union. When you, uh, when you talk, think about the issues, what issues, well, let's put this, of the issues that the Republican Party of Illinois has championed uh, in, in the recent past, uh, do you think those are the right issues that they should be uh, talking about, or should they be, are there some issues that would help broaden the base of the Republican Party in Illinois that maybe aren't being spoken to? Well, well, for, first of all, I, 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 you know, one thing I will give Governor Rauner credit for is that he tried to speak to everybody. Uh, he didn't just try to go out and reach the, you know, the uh, individuals in the Republican Party who only were concerned with uh, financial issues. He literally tried to go out and court some other social conservatives. Um, I think what you saw when, with, when uh, Jeannie Ives ran for governor, she ignited a firestorm within the conservative base in the state of Illinois. I don't think those issues should be left off the table, especially when you look at uh, what um, Governor Pritzker and, and even what Governor Rauner did in signing HB 40. I think I think they took that a whole a step further. You know, there's one thing to have a belief that uh, to fight against the act of abortion. There's another thing to have a belief to have everybody now pay for abortion with taxpayer money. That's an issue that we, that reverberates reverberates throughout the black even the black community. Uh, I've been watching a lot of um, institutions that are on Facebook or social media, and I watch because one of the things I, I like to do I like to sit and I like to watch, and I was able to see how a lot of these black entities were not in favor of what even what Governor Rauner did with signing HB forty. I think he took it a step further. I think what you see what, what's happening in Virginia, you know, with what they were trying to do with abortion there. You know the whole infanticide aspect of, of abortion. Uh, people of color are really not. Um, they'll fight against that issue. I think. And I, I think that's what that's where you're trying to go with um, when you see the divide between uh, the individuals that are fighting within the Republican Party for the heart and for the soul of the Republican Party. Should we talk about social issues? I do. I do think we should talk about social issues because I. I, I think I do believe that social issues have a financial aspect tied to it you know you, you look at what president trump is doing with criminal justice reform one of the things that i when i was in the general assembly i, I really um invested in criminal trust criminal justice reform um portions of of what uh, the democrat party was trying to do and what governor rado was trying to do because it has a fiscal impact um and, but, but i i think sometimes when you come into these communities of color and stuff and you see how you know, they try to uh, articulate that message. I think it gets lost in the weeds because, you know, and, and I had somebody say to me, I posted, I made a post last week about George Pearson being the chairman of the Will County Republican Party. Well, why try to mention color? Because now this individual can go into a community that you can't go into because he looks like someone who may not be someone that looks like you, Terry. I, I couldn't go into a community where, you know, but this George Wilson, he, George Pearson, he can go into the city of Chicago and, and have a conversation. And I, I think that's what that's what we're missing as a Republican Party. The ability to articulate a clear message in the in, in the in the exact tone and message that some people may not get, that the, especially the way that we as the Republican Party, we push out our message. I've, and I've been saying this since I've been in the General Assembly. Uh, we just need some people that are willing to go in there and articulate it and not when it's just election time. We always want to wait until it's election time to go after these people, and then our message is, it falls on deaf ears. Uh, I had uh, made a comment uh, a little while ago that uh, in I think in my lifetime uh, that President Trump is the first Republican president to actively go after the black vote and say yes. there are issues uh, that the Republican Party champions uh, that you as a constituency may may find the Republicans being a better home for you than, than the Democrats. Whereas, as people know, the uh, right now, I think uh, 
black Americans are voting roughly 90 percent or so uh, on the Democratic side of the uh, ticket. Yeah, and and they are. I, uh, President Trump just had a um, a little. There was some get together with a, a group of um, black conservatives. Did you hear about it anywhere? Posting in any of the the media? No, I didn't. I I went on the web the white the White House page and. I've I've only seen it on social media circles. I haven't seen any of that talked about throughout the media. But I'm telling you, I really believe that the Democratic Party is going to overplay their hand, and they're not going. They're not realizing what President Trump is doing. When he did the first first step act, blacks took notice. When he released the, I don't know if you recall that lady being released for. Uh, I believe she had some drug crime or something like that, and she was in there for life. Right. When, she, when he released her, these are just small incremental steps. And I think, and I, I, to, to Bruce Rauner's credit, Bruce Rauner understood that and he was trying to do that, but he, for some reason he just gave up uh, on his reelection um, and he, he, he stopped. He, in my opinion, he just totally didn't run. Uh, and, and then reports came out that he wasn't willing, to, he didn't really want to run. I mean, he could have stepped aside and Genie Eyes would have gave him a run for his money, that, that being Pritzker. What would you say if you could talk to um, uh, President Trump as he reaches out to black Americans? He makes the point that uh, unemployment is down. Uh, or what issues would resonate as far as you're concerned if the Republican Party was to make a more active outreach to the black, America, black Americans? And the, the thing that this is also critical is uh, because uh, so much of black America votes, and as I said, it's something like 90%, uh, yes. with, well, the, with the Democrats that you, you don't have to even win the majority of black voters to have a significant impact on how elections turn out Correct. Uh, with the elections often very close uh, my goodness if the Republicans picked up 25 percent of black uh, the black vote they would uh, probably carry the preponderance of, of the elections around the country I think you do what he's doing you you, you continue to highlight um, what's happening in the black community. And that's what he's been doing from day one. Uh, and, and, and to my point, that Republicans can learn a lot from this play, from what President Trump is trying to do. From the moment he ran for office, now some of the stuff he said was, you know, a little, little maybe suspect, but he's continued to highlight how, how his administration wants to help the black community. Uh, I don't know if you know Mays Jackson. I do not. Uh, but he has a, he has a uh, what's in it for the black people. Mace Jackson was one, uh, it, 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 he's on WVON uh, every morning. And he, I mean, he harps on what's in it for the black people, what's in it for the black people. I think President Trump is saying economic activity, a economic uh, prosperity is, is what's in it for the black people. Stick with me and I'll make sure that we bring it to the, uh, to, to your shores. But what, here's the problem. The problem is you have people like Ron Emanuel who didn't even want to have anything to do with President Trump. You know, you, 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 you hear these mayoral candidates saying, well, we, we don't want to even want to have conversations with President Trump. He's the president of the United States of America. He has the ability to bring funds into your, into your, your, your city. Why wouldn't you want to have a conversation with him? And when LaShawn Ford ran, who's state representative LaShawn Ford, he immediately said, yes, I want to have a conversation with President Trump. I want him to bring as many resources as possible to help the city of Chicago. And I think that was the right, the right thing to do and the right, the right mindset to go with. And I, I, I really believe that President Trump really wants to help. And you hear a lot of people say, well, he's racist. Well, show me where he's been racist. I've yet to see anything that, that would prove to me or show me that President Donald John Trump is a racist. I don't see it. I simply don't see it. I see a man who sees the plight of a people who've been, as you said, been voting 90% of the time with the same party, look throughout the look throughout the entire thread of the urban communities. They all have the same issues. Education, uh, funding, the funding with education. You look around in, in the dilapidated buildings in their communities. And President Trump is saying, I want to, here I am. I want to be able to come in and help. How can I do this? What do you need from the federal administration? What do you need from my administration to make these things happen? And remember this. You don't have to win 30, 40 percent. I, I believe the, 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 the number is anywhere. If you win 11 to 11 to 15 percent of the black vote, you win. 
and I believe Trump won like eight or nine nine percent. Mitt Romney and John McCain each had six percent of the black vote throughout the uh, throughout when they ran, and that's really one of the reasons why they didn't win. Now, President uh, uh, Trump, when he was a candidate, famously said, uh, speaking to black Americans, "What have you got to lose?" Uh, and you know, it surprised everyone that he was elected. Now that he's been the president for two years, what would you, how would you grade him uh, in general? And to what extent would you say, do you hear anything within uh, the black community? And not that you're talking just to black, uh, black Americans, but, but to the extent that you have your fingers on the pulse of the black community, um, do you hear a receptiveness among them to Trump or or they still confirm uh, voters with the Democratic Party? I'll tell you this. There's a hashtag. There's actually a couple of hashtags out there. The hashtags, hashtag Blexit, B-L-E-X-I-T. And then there's the hashtag walk away. I dare any of you, the people who are watching this video to type in those hashtags and they'll see just the, the, the sheer amount of positive energy and individuals who are that was specifically within the black community who are beginning to understand we can't we, we can't continue to be taken advantage of and they're, 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 they're starting to walk away from what they believe was the only party that could help them flex it and walk away I and mean, when you look at what Candace Owens is out there doing uh, you know, and even even to you know Charlie Charlie, even though Charlie Kirk is is not a black guy, but what he's been able to do on college campuses, I think he's I think they're really starting to give people something to think about. There's a clear articulation of something that's different, a clear articulation of a different plan, a clear articulation of a different party, not just the Democrat Party. And I think people are starting to wake up. You go to those hashtags and you see all the messages, you see all the the different people saying, and you look at what Kanye did. Kanye, who's from Chicago, you know, I, lo I know a lot of people. You know, he 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 kind of lost his black card uh, in a lot of the black communities. But guess what? Again, a man who just who doesn't believe in groupthink. You know, if you if you've been, I know you've been following some of the posts that I've made. I've I've literally have had friends disown me. People don't want to talk to me anymore because I continue to stand with President Trump. You know, I I. I it's one thing to say what you're going to do, which is what I believe Barack Obama did, but there's another thing to actually have the results, which I believe is what President Trump has been doing. He's been, I mean, every, and, and I, I don't think in my lifetime I've ever seen a, a president, maybe going back as far back as Reagan, but um, I've never seen a president who's actually, everything, almost everything he's campaigned on, he's actually brought to life. He's actually brought it to fruition it's actually been done i don't know about you have you seen a president actually campaign on something that it actually stuck to his guns i would say that it uh, uh, and and again uh, this is where everyone gets in trouble right because uh, president trump for whatever reason is very divisive it seems yeah. but uh i would say that i think uh, as a longtime observer of the political landscape uh, the president mm -hmm. trump has done pretty much what he signaled he would do yeah. in the uh, campaign for the presidency and to the extent that he hasn't been able to do it. Obviously, he's had a, uh, opposition from the Democratic Party on different <laughs> things, uh, as we now see with so uh, with the wall uh, and, yeah. and the opposition to build the wall. Um, not to go maybe a too far afield uh, and go down every rabbit hole, but to the extent that you have uh, your law enforcement background. Uh, either let's talk about the wall and and then also uh, let's bring it home to Illinois a little bit more. Uh, we have rec we have now Rahm Emanuel, and I think because of Laquan McDonald shooting in Chicago, so famous, um, didn't run. Now we're going to have uh, uh, a black woman for the first yeah. time uh, be the mayor of Chicago, either Lori yeah. Lightfoot or uh, or Tony Preckwinkle. And yeah. that election is coming up on April the 2nd. Um, so I, I know that's kind of a grab bag of issues there, but uh, <laughs> it, let's, just, let's just chow on, on those for a while. Let's start with the wall. Just on the wall, well, do you when, have any quick ideas as far as your own background in law enforcement? Sure, when it, when it, when it comes to the wall, 
who are the experts? You know, I heard Nancy Pelosi say, and I've heard a couple other Democrats say, well, the experts say, well, who are your experts? Uh, I know being in law enforcement, the, the experts are those who are on the ground, those who are out there dealing with these issues on a day in and day out basis. Um, I, I don't know any ICE agent or any border patrol agent who hasn't said we don't need a wall in certain aspects of the earth. See, this is where I believe President Trump missed the messaging on this and, and how he missed message on this. Uh, because when he just kept saying build a wall, he never he was never specific in what the plan would be. And so immediately people started thinking we were gonna build a 2000 mile wall. Well, no, that's not what we're building. We're building a wall in, or, or barrier. And I, I, I kept screaming, stop calling it a wall. Start calling it what it is. It's a barrier. It's a barrier to stop people from getting into our country illegally. And it's not just about Mexicans. It's about terrorists. It's about human trafficking. It's a, and, and thank God he finally understood and caught on to that. Um, I, would, I would continue to keep it where the, the ex, what are the experts saying about the wall? And border, uh, the Border Patrol and ICE are saying, we need it. I believe it's, if, 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 I don't, if I recall correctly, it's in like two to two, anywhere between two to 700 miles of border wall or barriers that we need. And I agree. I agree. A wall isn't, isn't everything. I think we have to fix the broken immigration, immigration system. We're still operating on an immigration system uh, from decades on now. We have to fix that. You know, it, somebody's going to have to be willing to do, to, to take the political uh, courage, to have the political courage to do to make some decision that may have make that may make them lose an election to fix this immigration system because we we it had, when was the last time we really done a real full comprehensive uh, fix on our immigration system I'm talking about going after everything because I can build a wall you can build a wall what happens when they tell them to under it they and which is what they're doing all over and it's not just Mexicans it's, it's all this I'm afraid that we're gonna allow somebody in here with a bomb that's gonna go off somewhere in New York. And so many people's lives are gonna be uh, lost because we were we, we were willing to play politics and not protect the men and women of, of the state, of, of the country. That's my concern, Jerry. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I'll, maybe I'll connect the dots uh, to uh, the wall in Chicago. A few, a couple of years ago, I was talking to the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency uh, in Chicago, and uh, they said to me, uh, about five years ago, that uh, it, the Mexican drug cartels are yes. the ones that are distributing the drugs in Chicago. They're coming up yes. Highway 55, and so when we talk about the violence uh, on the south side of Chicago and the west side of Chicago, and I, I take it, not being an expert on this, that the, a lot of that violence is from uh, fighting over the drug wars uh, in the city and turf, but it's it's part and parcel of what we see coming up from the, the Mexican drug cartels and the millions or billions of dollars that they're making. And yes. an interesting statistic I heard the, just the other day, because it, like so many people, I think sometimes we have big stories happening, but we don't focus on them in our day-to-day -day yeah. lives. Yeah. In 2017, 70,000 Americans overdosed, at, died, yes. uh, died, I should say, not just, uh, 70,000 died of an overdose. Yes. And yes. so how many more are addicted and haven't yet overdosed? How many yes. people, if you multiply that by their brothers and sisters and moms and dads and coworkers and friends, uh, yes. you know, you're talking about millions of people in the United States population who are impacted directly or indirectly uh, by this massive infusion of illegal drugs coming into the country. And one can only guess when you look at the, the amount of law enforcement money spent on this, on the amount of incarceration spent on this, on our court system, dealing with it, uh, on and on and on, uh, that we are spending billions of dollars uh, from, from this illegal trade. Yeah, and, and I, I think you, uh, when you when you look at the reason why Chicago is so attractive is because, and, and Chicago is a hub. You, you name the vice, you name the issue, Chicago is a hub because you can come from Chicago 
and go anywhere in the United States of America. And that's the reason why the drug trade, it, 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 it stimulates, uh, it, it starts here. That's the reason why the human trafficking aspect is here. I don't know if you remember one of my, the first bill that I passed was the, um, the tattoo bill that allowed um, individuals who were trafficked, who were under 18 to come into a, uh, a, a tattoo mm -hmm. parlor and have their tattoo removed, not just covered up, but removed. Uh, it, a lot of it had to do with the human trafficking issue. And my, my, my good friend, Chris Baker from Inc. 180, who works with the Homeland Security and the FBI, uh, they bring traffic young people to his shop to have these tattoos removed. And it's, it's just, it's so disheartening. And, and I mean, think about that. Just really just stop and think about that. You know, it's 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 something that we 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 have to be willing to to to, to do whatever needs to be done to get it solved. You know, I, and you're right, and that's something I've uh, fortunately not had to face directly in my life, but I have interviewed several people as part of the Illinois Channel's coverage uh, who were part of human trafficking here in Illinois, mm -hmm. and it is and almost like this subterranean reality that that yeah. uh, those of us who are law-abiding and just you know go through our day-to-day -day lives we're not aware of all these influences that are happening around us but maybe it's just not within our circle so we tend to minimize just how significant it is yeah I, when i was in arizona i believe it was 2015 a group of us went down to the went down to the wall and it's it's a scary sight Terry, it's, it's, I mean, you literally can, you see, literally see people walking across, like it's, like they're just going from one side of the street to the other. Uh, we were, able, we, we saw this and it was, we, we were looking at each other like, is this really happening? And it was, it's just, it's, I think that was in 20, I believe it was in Arizona in 2015, I don't recall. I was there for a conference and it's, it's just, and, and when you talk to the people who live close to the border, who see, you know, a lot of what's going on, the crime, you know, and they'll tell you. And some parts of that border are really, really scary to live by. One of the first things that, that I would, would convey to the, to the policing agency is, have you met with anybody from the Black Lives Matter organization? Have you guys sat down to hear them out, to see what, what, what their issues are, what they're talking about? Um, I also have a, a, an organization called The Eight that I'm building out. And it's an organization that will go into uh, policing agencies and hopefully in, in, in a lot of the in a lot of the things that you, you just the, the questions you just posed to me um, but I, I think sometimes we we're, we're so quick to dismiss groups like black lives matter we, 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 we quickly dismiss what they have to say before we're actually trying to hear them we need to listen to them and figure out what is any what are they trying to say what are they, because guess what Terry, a lot of people don't know this. I became a police officer because I was beaten by police officers. I literally, yes, I, Chicago PD beat me. I mean, I, now, was I in the role? Yes, I was in a stolen car when I was 16, 17, 17. I was, I just turned 17 years old. Didn't know the car was stolen, the keys were in the car and everything. And next thing you know, I woke up and I was, all I heard was the individual in the car say, run. So what do you do when you're black and you, you were in the, we, we were up in the Rogers Park area. I ran. And then when they stopped me, I said, what are, what, what, what are you guys chasing me for? I said, well, your car is stolen. Well, what happened was the individual that, um, so the guys who, who had the car, they rented it out from a drug, a drug user. When he called to have his car back, he didn't return it back to him. So then he called the police to report the car stolen. And I literally had a black eye and they choked me out. They choked, first of all, they choked me to the point uh, he put on something in his glove and he hit me in the eye and my eye completely swole up. And then he choked me out until I passed out. So I'm not somebody who don't, who, who, I understand. I've, I've actually felt the sting of police, police brutality. It's happened to me in my life. Not just that one time. I've been slammed on cars by cops. I'm walking down the street, minding my own business, and they stop and harass. So I get that it happens. The problem is we're not having communication. We're not, we're not talking to each other. We're talking over each other, and we're missing each other on the way of trying to come to a solution because 
Does police brutality happen? Yes. Are there bad police officers in, on police departments? Yes. But what most people say, well, they, got, they put up the blue wall of silence. No. Trust me. If there's a bad cop on the force, every cop that's, that's a good person, a woman, will get together and say, we got to get this guy or this girl off of our department. And they'll go and fig and they'll go and talk to the command staff. And then you just can't fire a cop. That's just not that's just not how it happens. You know, and so one of the first things I would do, which before I left the General Assembly, I reached out to um, the ACLU to try to secure a meeting with me with the Black Lives Matters crowd. One of the bills, another bill that I was working on before I left, I wanted to go through the entire um, uh, criminal book uh, and, and see where, what crimes did we need, which ones did we not, to go through the entire criminal code and figure out what needed to be taken out. Because the problem, the, the real problem that happened in law enforcement was when we became known as law enforcement officers. We were initially peace officers, meaning we went out and we, 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 we went through the community. People knew us in the community. But the moment we became a revenue generator for a lot of these different cities is when a lot changed within the, with, with the community and policing. It completely shifted because now all, we, all a lot of the elected officials cared about was bringing home the bacon, making money. And that shifted the relationship. I saw it. You know, even before I was a cop, I saw it. And so those are some of the things I, I, I look at. Um, I look at the um, um, Chief Zeman, or Zeman, Zeman from uh, Aurora, and some of the things that she's been implementing with, with, with as to community problems between policing and these different communities of Aurora. I look at Chief Meyer down here in Manuka. Uh, who's looking at ways of how he can continue to make sure that the citizens of Manuka are protected, but at the same time, figure out ways to make the community better with all those that are within the community. You know, it's uh, as I hear you speak, it reminds me, and I appreciate you participating in this discussion. I think so often in our society, sadly, we just don't have these conversations enough and tap into what we know and and what you know and what you could bring you to the table and, and all of us all of us have something to bring to the table but so many times right. we're i think reluctant just to have an honest conversation and as you and i know so many times and sadly um maybe it was different before television but uh e even as so we're in democracy as we're in the state capitol or the u.s capitol so many times we're not having honest conversations with one another it ends up being political theater and as you right. say we're talking past one another and it's like who gets the better sound bite and we see the calling everybody names and uh, yeah. uh, you know as you i'm sure know and it's not just you but other people people within their own party whether they're democrats they have opposition within their own party Republicans have opposition within their own party. They're throttled down and said, don't say this or don't speak right. about something. And so it's, uh, this is one well, of the Terry, reasons we to want me. to have this conversation. I think of Voices of Illinois, because you're making some oh, very Terry. interesting points and uh, appreciate it. That happened to me when, when, when I was in the General Assembly, there was like um, so many things, oh, you can't vote for this. You can't say this, you can't do this. And it was like, why, well, why? You know, and I think a lot of a lot of it was I represented a 90 percent white district. And here I am, the first black person to ever represent this district ever. And they didn't want to ruffle any feathers. But my thing is what what the people in my district so loved about me was that I was I, I would always tell them the truth. And when I had I, I felt so conflicted at times. Uh, Art, Art, I, I remember helping Art Turner uh, pass a bill that I had to vote no on, but I still was able to help him get Republican votes on. I remember helping, um, uh, what's his name? He's out of Highland Park, Scott. Um, uh, he, he ran for governor and then he ran for attorney general. Uh, well, I, I helped him on a bill. And I mean, he'd been trying to pass this bill. Uh, Elaine Neckwood, she, she was trying to pass that DUI bill um, for, I think she said three or five years. 
Uh, see, I, I was a bridge. And one of the things that LG, uh, I should say State Senator LG, Sims, and uh, now Attorney General Kwame Raoul loved about working with me because I was that bridge builder. I was the I had the ability to go back to the Republican Party and break up that you know that monotony of of just hearing an opinion from one vantage point from one viewpoint. You know I came in and 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 and, and changed that because I experienced a lot of the stuff that they were saying on the other other side of the aisle. You know and I was able to convey uh, the message that they were trying to say and 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 not so much of a threatening way. Where people begin to understand. I, I remember one time Ray, Raymond Poe, um, Scott Drury, that's his name. He was doing. He was trying to pass a bill uh, where if if a person got uh, called the police because there was an alcohol over overdose, uh, that they wouldn't go to jail. I went to Raymond Poe and I said, Ray, I saw that you were a no on this bill, and I said. Uh, I'm trying to help Scott Drury pass this bill and was wondering if you can, if we can count you as a yes. He looked me in the eye, he said, son, only because you you want me to vote for this bill will I vote for this bill. Put me down as a yes. The Republican party really hadn't had that, you know, prior to me getting into the General Assembly. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, I had my, you know, my problems with the Black Caucus when I initially joined. But once they all got to know me, they started seeing that I really was I read the bills, first of all, and I really was trying to figure out how, if, if it didn't affect my district, did it? how would it affect the state of Illinois? And if it didn't affect it negatively, I was all in uh, on helping a, a person get a bill passed. And I think uh, I, I get calls from, from some of them every now and again and say, boy, do we miss you down here. Yeah. With that in mind, uh, what now that we, ha we have a the first time ever, uh, a, a black woman as the lieutenant governor. We're going to have yes. uh, a black woman as the mayor of Chicago, as we mentioned yes. earlier. We have Kwame Raoul, who uh, yes. is now longtime senator, about 12 years or so, and now uh, the attorney general. What yes. impact does that have, uh, if you can speak Speak, uh, your, I guess, on what you know, the sense, it's, a, it's more of a sense of what you have. What impact does that have on the black community? And maybe for the, and, and you know, those, we're kind of straddling party lines to some extent here, but, but does that have on people maybe joining uh, a political party, of running for office, of feeling that they are empowered and that they have more of an influence than perhaps they felt that they had before? Well, I, I, I speak, I, I start with the Chicago mayoral race. Uh, nobody in there, nobody predicted that it would be like for, uh, so mo a lot of people, you know, spoke and thought that Tony Preckwinkle would be uh, one and maybe um, Bill Daly. Um, I think <laughs> Jerry Joyce all but destroyed any chance of Bill Daly winning. But uh, I, I, no, I, I think, I think when, you know, I, my daughters, I have five daughters, and when they looked at that and they saw that there were two women, it made them it made them feel good. I think I think I think that's something that's something that shouldn't be discounted. I mean, this is this is historical. This is a historical moment. I don't care what party you belong to. Um, this is this is um, when Juliana Stratton became lieutenant governor. That's historic. Uh, I think you applaud that. When Barack Obama, I didn't vote for Barack Obama uh, either time he ran for president, but when he ran when he won the first time, I applauded that. Because it was his story. It was it was it was a person who did everything they needed to do to become president of the United States of America. And I think no matter what, I, I'm not one of those people that you know you know will will, will you know downplay um, just because they're not part of the party that I belong to. No, no. This is this was this is an awesome moment in the state of Illinois um, to be involved in politics because we now have the ability. There there will be history made uh, come April second. Uh, with Lori Lightfoot or uh, Tony Perkins. I personally think Lori Lightfoot's going to be the one to come out on top. Um, if, if I had a vote in it, that's who I'd vote for, uh, Lori Lightfoot, not um, Perkins. That's, just, that's my, my purview. Uh, when it comes to someone like, like Kwame Raul, um, Kwame and I worked a lot together. Uh, I personally think he's a great guy. Uh, we, he and I, we don't agree. Uh, and Kwame and I, we, we would go back and forth when we were debating specifically the 
police reform bill. You know, I was the top Republican negotiator on that bill, along with John Cabello. And Kwame knew where I stood, and I knew where he stood. But and but there was a respect. And one thing I can say, Kwame Waiwu, um, and and the LG Sims, they they really respected the line because they knew uh, where I stood. But they also knew that they could talk at least have a conversation. We can at least have a conversation. And I think I think it's really powerful. And I think I think I think a place like Chicago is missing this. It's really powerful to see black people on the Republican side and black people on the Democrat side leading a discussion and leading a, a particular state or a particular city. I think that's powerful throughout and that reverberates throughout the nation when that can happen. And, and, and that's, what I, that, that's one of the reasons why I, 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 I ran. Um, and wanted to get involved in being a state representative. Because, I mean, I had so many people reached out to me who were black, even um, when I left, just saying, wow, we're gonna miss you. We hate that you're gonna be, you're leaving, you know? And I, I'm gonna save that from a book that I'm writing. Um, uh, the, just the story of, of, of leaving, uh, everything that happened after that. I'm, I'm actually writing a book about that. And I, I really believe it's gonna be a story of you know, redemption. When, uh, do you have any idea when that would be published? Um, I don't know if you know, but I'm part of a self-publishing company. I, um, actually my wife's book will be, she's getting ready to have her first book published, maybe Mar um, May, I think it is. Uh, prob mine will probably be published somewhere October, November-ish. I've been working on it. I'm just telling my story, you know, um, the people who have yet to hear from me, you're the first time, um, me being on this show is the first time people are, have heard from me in a while. Uh, I, you, you, one of the things that I'm trying to do is just just be a better person, be a better dad, be a better husband. Uh, I, I have failings in those areas, but what I'm trying to do now is just be a better person and give back to the next generation of people that are under me, you know, and to show them, hey, look, there's a better way. And specifically when it comes to the minority people in, in our state, figuring out how we can get them to hear another side of a message, uh, another side of a coin, uh, same coin, just a different side of the message. And I think, I think you know, free enterprise, free markets is something that the, the, the communities of Chicago know, they've experienced it, they just haven't clearly heard it articulated from a perspective. And that's why they continue to gravitate back to anybody with a D in front of their name. I hope I hope to be part of the future that 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 changes that throughout this state and throughout this nation. Well, I would I was going to say I could probably talk to you for another hour because I find this <laughs> fascinating and you're making some very interesting discussions here. Um, I would follow up to say I, I think it is good as you said earlier when we were talking about getting more uh, candidates and you have black candidates uh, in the Republican Party. We have. Mm -hmm this movement of the walk away and uh, black is it blacks it is that, Blacks, it? Uh, that the blacks, blacks exiting the democratic party yes. and, and uh, if people aren't familiar with uh, in fact there was a fellow today at uh, the cpac as we tape this uh the conservative political action committee uh, conference that a lot of conservatives attend one of the speakers prior to the president speaking today was a gay fellow who started the walk away movement and but the larger point I would say is I think it's healthy for American democracy uh, for us to have people ac across the board in both parties because we we don't want to have groupthink and we want to get this divergent of opinion and as we've already discussed and I think this is the kind of insight that you bring uh, because you've been in the legislature and to say, and to the fact that you represented a, a predominantly white community when you're in the legislature, it's not to say that if you you're black that you can't represent a, a white community, or if that you're white you can't represent a black community. You are the advocate for your district, and you represent yes. their area. Um, yes. But look, I could I, I I've already uh, kept you longer than I intended to, <laughs> but this is uh, fascinating and. Uh, I hope we can do this again, and I think when we say, I'm more than open for you know, the voices of Illinois, this is exactly what we want to do, and not just be talking 
in the capital or just be talking, as I say, in Chicago. We get so much of that. It's important that we reach out as we have, and we appreciate you joining us today, John. Before we close out, what's uh, what's the future? So you're, you're a consultant, as we touch base on. I think you might be, uh, actually, as we scratch the surface here, probably could do a very good job maybe working with some of the uh, police departments around the country because you, you bring a unique perspective on that. Well, that's what my organization, 1078, um, that, I'm, that I've started, uh, it looks to intend to do. Um, not, nothing, not, I, I'm not looking to take away anything that FOP does or any of the other policing agencies uh, or, or, or agencies that um, um, lobby or whatever on behalf of police. I want to come alongside them and help help them in ways because because I've been behind the curtain of, 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 of a state legislative, uh, le legislative body. I know how people think. I know how is how they interweave things. And I, I hope and, and not I don't want to just lobby on behalf of police officers. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm also trying to do with this 1078 is to have what's called a go bag for every cop that's in um, that, that, that drives a squad car in the state of Illinois, state of Illinois beginning with that and then spreading it out throughout the nation. Um, if there's a shooting, an officer uh, needs uh, the, the stuff from his shooting, um, the coagulator, I want him to be able to dig in a bag and if he had to use it on a civilian, pour it on into, onto a civilian so that we can say help save the lives of a lot more people that are shot by, even by pop cops or shot by other people. Um, I want to be able to help cops with their vests. You know, a lot of a lot of cops throughout the state of Illinois don't wear vests. Uh, they're very expensive. I want to. I want my organization to be able to help um, either pay outright for these vests. Uh, I want to be able to help them go through training, for, uh, create different type of training scenarios for them. You know, I want I want the community. I I, I really believe if 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 policing agencies would involve the community more. I think you know, even when it comes to training, have them go through some of the training that cops go through. Uh, understanding the law aspect of it. Just because you see a cop hitting somebody does not mean it's illegal. If what I believe what people have an issue with is the training that cops go through. But if people, more people saw and understood what some of that training was, I think it would really help them when it comes times when they when, so when they start seeing something that happens out on the street they'll know oh whoa that guy's in a row that girl like you know i don't remember know if you recall the shooting that happened on the east side of, of uh, chicago when they said the guy didn't have a gun he didn't do nothing he had nothing next thing you know the video shows the guy clearly reaching for his gun you know those are type those are training scenarios that you can take the public through so that they begin to understand the nature of policing it's a nasty 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 nature the stuff that ha that that police officers go through uh the mental angst that they have to go through and some of the things these these are some of the things that i think would help better uh community communities in the policing uh and i think it'll help merge and make it make better um just just overall better communication between communities and policing we can do this it's going to take a lot of hard work but i, I really believe we can do this i do wants to have the police uh, go away. Uh, we all know that we need to have um, uh, police officers. Uh, well, some people do want them to go away. <laughs> there have been people who, who do want them to go away. I would think that's a, a very small minority, but I, I, yeah, I think by the same minority. token, I think what people uh, one, and I think that you've touched on, is uh, just that we need to have more of an intersection of the community working with officers and, and, and saying, how can we work together? And let's have some honest conversations. Um, and maybe and that's been Eddie missing Johnson, sometimes. Superintendent Eddie Johnson, really, uh, I, I, I give him his credit. He's really embraced that aspect in Chicago. Um, I think a lot of the old heads, you know, people that come from a, a certain generation of policing, uh, policing has changed. It's different. Um, policing, you, you're now looked upon to be a counselor. Uh, uh, while you're out on the street, you know, you, you have to you have to do more roles than just, you know, arresting people and locking people up. It's, it's just it's, it's part of it. It, it has evolved into, as being part of the job. But I do believe that there are some good people out there, 99.7 percent 
of the men and women that put on that uniform, strap up those boots, put on that uh, badge, walk out there wanting to do a good job for the community they serve. I started to uh, hang up on you before. Uh, let, me, let me throw out one last thing while we're talking on sure. this, though, and maybe we should do a follow-up conversation on this. Uh, Kwame Raul has uh, been very involved, uh, as Governor Rauner, to his credit, was on uh, prison reform, among other things, or law enforcement reform. And I think uh, President Trump is working on that as well. Yes. Uh, in a short synopsis, and again, we could probably and maybe should follow up on another time on this. It's a, it's a big conversation that I won't allow us to go off uh, for another hour on. But uh, what what would you say, what are your general thoughts about, are, are there any low-hanging fruit, something that really sticks out to you that those of us who have not been involved in law enforcement don't see, but that you see, and uh, through your conversations also with the uh, uh, various people as you were uh, a state representative what yeah. what what I'll do you say this. hey this is something we should change right away or these are three things we should change right away i know i know one of the things when i was in the general assembly the budget for doc was 1.4 billion dollars it's with b 1.4 billion um i think when you look at how we do prison and let me interject that uh, that was the department of corrections in case people didn't catch that correct. uh so one point how much for 1.4 billion dollars for jailing people and when we say right. let's cut state spending yeah. uh to some extent that would be one way on the other hand we don't want to cut state state spending uh at the at the risk of our lives or of our, our families lives right correct I, I i think i think one of the ways you you, you look at changing and how we sending people to prison uh crimes against property don't send them to the penitentiary. Don't send them to a Department of Correction. Let's figure out a way that we can we can either house them, continue to house them in our in a lot of these county jails, which stay pretty much empty, or figure out a way of home confinement. Uh, I, I personally believe that'll save us a lot of money. Somebody with a DUI should never see, unless they kill or harm somebody, hurt somebody bad in the crash, they should never see the inside of a Department of Correction. But you have that in the Department of Correction, people who've committed, Committed DUIs. I think we also need to look at how we need to go into these violations of probation, parole. You know, um, we send people back on technical violations. Let's figure out how we can change that. Uh, we we have we have within our means the ability to really reform prison. The woman that was in prison for life, the President Trump um, uh, released, should have never been in prison that long. How about we go through? Uh, I, I and this is I probably get in trouble for saying this, but I I did rapid repat. Rapid repat was we we looked throughout our our our, our prison system. I believe at the time we had over two thousand people who were here illegally in our country. It would be cheaper to, to to send them back to their home state on a plane than it was to continue to house them for the low level crimes that they committed to be to end up in our jail. These are ways that we can begin to go and think about, we have to think outside the box. We really do. And that's why I'm hoping um, Governor Pritzker, uh, and I know that um, Christian Mitchell, he has over there, Deputy Governor, uh, that's what he, I'm telling, he's probably one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. Um, I've been able to you know, send him a message saying, you, you, you gotta think about really cleaning out the Department of Corrections. I mean, cleansing, giving it a complete cleansing and put, put a reformer in there, somebody that's willing to, just go in there and just make the hard and tough decisions. Yeah, you know, sometimes when I, I've had uh, through the, I, what I love about my job is I get to talk to people like you and learn uh, outside my own uh, experience. And yeah. you hear from time to time things that just make your jaw drop. And I know Tom Dart, uh, the sheriff of Cook County, was talking at the Union League Club one day and talking about because somebody would uh, couldn't post a hundred dollars in bail they would stay in in jail where the taxpayers are feeding them housing them and they would stay in there for months for a minor that, infraction because they couldn't come up with a hundred dollars the taxpayers are paying ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars to keep them in there it it's just yeah. from an economic standpoint and just from a 
benefit the society it's madness but sometimes we don't have anyone questioning the system we just say well that's the way it's always been done i personally believe that the state of illinois needs what they, they, they need a lean person somebody to come in and, and look to see how we do continuous improvement for the state of illinois i think we need to go through each and every single department to figure out what needs to be cut how do we push this out how do we make this better uh where are the redundancies uh I think Governor Rauner initially was trying to do that, but I think he got caught up in the fight with Madigan, uh, which was probably the dumbest thing you could have ever he could have ever done uh, <laughs> to get into that fight with with one of the and, and I'm not running for office again. I'll say it: one of the greatest tacticians to ever grace this United States of America. The Speaker Madigan is 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 when it comes to tactics and, and figuring out an opponent, he 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 know he's seven eight steps ahead of you. And I think I think that's the part that Governor Rana didn't realize about, you know, just who he was dealing with, you know, and uh, there were a group of us that, hey, look, dude, let's, hey, let's figure this out. Let's compromise. Let's do government, you know, and he just wasn't willing to, to bend. John Anthony, uh, we so much appreciate your taking the time to talk with us. It's been fascinating. Like I said, uh, I'm sure there's a lot more in there that we could dig into and maybe we can do it again and I, I'd look forward to doing that. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me and uh, I'm more than uh, happy to uh, do this again with you, Terry. Thank Great. you. Thanks so much, John. Thank you for watching the Illinois Channel. You may also wish to follow us online where you are free to make comments or program suggestions. Get our breaking news updates on Twitter where you can find us at Illinois Channel. You can find our past programming on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Illinois Channel TV. Or you can go to the Illinois Channel website at illinoischannel.org. There you can find not only our current video stories and programs, but also our library of past programs, as well as articles that provide additional information about Illinois issues and individuals. The Illinois Channel, keeping you connected to your state, your issues, your home.